This podcast is a proud member of the Edify Podcast Network. Listen to thousands of Christian podcasts at edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. This episode is brought to you in part by the Thompson Chain Reference Bible from Zondervan. With over 100,000 references covering more than 8,000 topics, it's ideal for comprehensive topical study. Updated editions are available in the NIV and KJV. Visit ThompsonChainReferenceBible.com for more. Hey, I'm Natalia Parisi from Los Angeles, California. I am an office assistant and I love listening to Compel because the stories inspire me to seek God deeper. Episode 16 inspired me to seek and offer forgiveness to someone from my past. The way God works in our lives is truly amazing. Enjoy today's episode. I mean, I'm laying it all down. I'm saying I'm ready. God, I don't care if I'm in a gas station for five minutes or if I'm in Haiti for 50 years. I just want to do what you've called me to do. I'm Paul Hastings, and you're listening to Compelled, a seasonal podcast using gripping, immersive storytelling to celebrate the powerful ways God is transforming Christians around the world. Last week, we heard from Andy and Jamie Stewart, a young Christian couple expecting their first child when they received the crushing news that their baby was not going to survive. How could they trust a God who would let that happen? Again, you can hear that story by tuning into last week's episode with Andy and Jamie Stewart. Today, our guest is Josh Howard, an unlikely missionary to India who has seen God work in incredible ways and multiply disciples like never before. So gather around, lean in, and join us for another compelling story from the kingdom of God. Back in 2019, we released an episode with Robert Harris about frontline missions. It's a great story, and you should go back and listen to that one. It's episode 19. But after that interview, Robert introduced us to another friend of his, Josh, and that's who our guest is today. Although Josh lives and works in India, he was coming back to the U.S. in the spring of 2020, so we scheduled an interview. But then, of course, COVID happened, and flights between the U.S. and India were canceled as the rest of the world basically shut down. Thankfully, our schedules realigned two years later, and this past spring, I finally got to sit down with Josh at a friend's house as he passed through Austin. And how Josh got to the mission field is an interesting story, which begins in St. Louis, Missouri, where he grew up in a Christian home. My mom and I lived with my grandparents, uh, her mom and dad, because I, uh, my, my mom and dad got divorced when I was four years old. And so my dad left, um, wasn't a big part of my life growing up. I mean, I would go to his house, you know, every other weekend, things like that. Um, but we didn't have that great of a relationship early on at at that time. It was basically my mom and I and my grandparents. And so My grandpa was a deacon in the church. He would take us to church every single Sunday. Uh, I I grew up in that environment. And from a very early age, really began to love Jesus. I remember I was eight years old. We were at my great grandparents' house for a lunch after a a Sunday service. Around the table, my family was talking about the moments they gave their life to Jesus. I'm eight years old, okay? I'm listening to these stories of people being baptized and people coming to Jesus. And I break down crying at the table, okay? Like at eight years old. And my mom's like, Josh, what's wrong? And I was like, I really wanna be baptized. I wanna give my life to Jesus. And so my family starts asking me these questions to see if I really get what I'm saying, right? And, uh, you know, at eight years old, I, I probably didn't know all the good, you know, all the bells and whistles of the Christian faith, but I did really just want to follow Jesus and give my life to him. And so that night, um, my uh, family, at that time, we still had Sunday night church that was different from Sunday morning church. And so we went to the Sunday night service and my grandpa uh, baptized me that night. And uh, I still remember sitting afterwards with my uncle, who was also kind of a f- father figure in my life, and taking my first communion with him and, and uh, just, you know, feeling like I had made the best decision of my life, you know? Yeah. And so that type of environment continued. Fast forward a few years, I was 13 years old. I 
still loved Jesus, would invite friends to church with me, stuff like that. They were doing this youth service and they asked me if I wanted to, to preach. I never really thought about that before. At that time in my life, I wanted to be, I think, a lawyer. That was what I wanted to do, okay? Um, and so I was like, yeah, I'll do that, right? So leading up to you know, this, uh, this big service that we were gonna be doing, my uncle every couple of weeks would ask me, hey, do you need help? Do you need help preparing? No, I'm fine, I got this, you know. Uh, a week before, Josh, you, you know, you're speaking next week. Yeah, 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 I got it. I hadn't prepared anything, okay. Nice. Um, and so Sunday comes, Sunday morning, we get home after church and um, I, I come to my uncle and I'm like, I have no idea what I'm talking about tonight. Like I'm nice. preaching like three hours. <laughs> okay? Nice. And he's like, Josh, I've been asking you for weeks if you needed my help. So we went down to his youth minister library and he had this object lesson book, one of those really cheesy object lesson books. And I flipped through it real quick and found this lesson on temptation. And I needed to get a stick and get a toy rat and like have a rat trap and how Satan tempts us, you know, and all that. It was the cheesiest thing ever, man. Like, yeah. So I remember being on the way to service on, on like to preach. And I'm writing down a few scriptures that I'm going to talk about. And I literally asked my uncle in the car, Uncle Kerry, it, don't preachers say something after they read a passage of scripture? <laughs> like, I can't just read a bunch of scriptures, you know? And uh, he's laughing at me because he's like, I've been telling you I'll help you and you didn't take it, right? Yeah. So I get up there, man. It's like the worst message ever. I was supposed to preach for 20 minutes and got done in like five. But when I sat down that night, um, I knew, man, there was nothing else I wanted to do in this world. Um, God gripped my heart that night and called me into ministry, even though it was a horrible message. Uh, it was, you know, very, I, I did, I wasn't prepared, but the Holy spirit gripped me that night. And I never looked back, man. If you would have asked me at 13, 14, 15 years old, what I wanted to do, it was always preach. I want to be a preacher. Hmm. I mean, I, I found recently a, uh, <laughs> a, um, a, a, my sophomore year of high school in my psychology class, we had to write an obituary, okay? And at 15, right, I'm in uh, my sophomore year of high school, uh, I found it a few years ago. The obituary was like, I, I don't remember it word for word, but it was basically like how I traveled the world and preached the gospel, you know, and, and led hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. And, and, and so that was kind of my dream. But all throughout that season, man, I was living this life for Jesus on Sunday, but living completely different at different times throughout the week. You know what I mean? Even as a 13, 15, 16 year old. Oh yeah. Now, despite Josh's desire to be a pastor, he was actually living a double life. He had stumbled across pornography when he was in middle school and it had dug in deep. And Josh, unfortunately, was very promiscuous at times. But then there would be seasons when he would be convicted and repent and run away from it. But then other moments where he would do a 180 and run right back to it. But on Sundays, he would always revert back to being the preacher kid at church. He always had the right Sunday school answers and looked like a good church going kid. At school, he was super outgoing, friendly, and would talk about Jesus publicly and write about him in his school papers. But internally, Josh was super messed up struggling with all of these secret sexual sins in addition to pride and arrogance. Basically, he was a modern-day Pharisee, but in the body of a middle schooler. For years, he wrestled with this double life. But then one day, his world was flipped upside down. And so, you know, here I am, bro, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, right? All this stuff going on. And then everything blew up. My grandfather, who baptized me, who was the father figure in my life, who was my mom's rock. At 13, he had a stroke, um, was paralyzed on his left side, and I had to watch him go through that. He was a super active farmer, blue collar kind of guy, and then couldn't do any of that anymore, right? And so I'm watching him at 13, 14, 15 years old, fighting a stroke and then getting diagnosed with brain cancer, going through chemo and radiation. We're at the hospital every day after school with him, like just a mess, right? Really broken, difficult situation. And then he dies. And I, it, it wrecked me. 
Um, he was the first super close person in my life that died that I lost. And a month later, okay, my uncle, who I took my first communion with, uh, helped me with my first sermon. His wife got arrested for um, having inappropriate relationship with a 13 year old kid in our youth group. Wow. And so, in a matter of a month, I had lost my grandfather to death. My aunt went to prison. I never talked to her or saw her again. I lost my uncle emotionally because it wrecked. He had no idea it was happening. It wrecked him and our family. I lost my mom emotionally. She became a closet alcoholic at that point uh, because she lost her father and was really struggling inside. And so at 15, I think I've got this amazing tight knit family that we're all in this together. And all of a sudden, everything's gone. Yeah. I felt alone. Um, I was an only child, didn't have brothers or sisters at that time. My dad and I still had not quite reconciled yet. And so here I am at 16. Emotionally, my mom's gone. My grandpa is dead. My uncle emotionally gone. My aunt's in prison. And everything's just massively different. If you would have asked me as a kid at 15, how was my childhood? It, I would have said, yeah, my dad wasn't around. That was really tough. But my mom and my grandparents have been amazing. And, you know, like my dad's mom and dad, they lived in Tennessee. They literally would drive once a month from Tennessee, five hours to St. Louis to see me every month. Okay. They were amazing people. The whole family was incredible. Okay. And then at 16, it's like, boom, bomb blast, wow. everything changes. And so I really began to get a lot more serious about Jesus during that season of my life. When I would look back on those seasons, like at four when my dad left or at 13 when my grandpa had a stroke or at 16 when he died or when my aunt was arrested, all those moments, when, when I would look back on them, I felt alone, like I was broken, like I was hurt. And as an adult, as I was praying and processing through those things, Jesus began to put these images in my mind, almost like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire when there was the fourth man there. Jesus began to put these images in my mind of him wrapping his arms around me at four years old when my dad's walking out the door or being in the room with my family when my grandfather took his last breath and we were all holding hands watching him die or the time I was in the car that I found out my aunt was arrested. I, I see all these moments in my life and see his arms around me, see that he never left me, that he never forsook me. He, he never let all that go. And it was during the most difficult, stormy, broken seasons of my life, man, that I began to see that God was with me through those moments. He was the father I longed to have growing up. He was the one that never left, that loved me even in the midst of my brokenness, knew the secret life I was living, and still came and loved me and helped me through them, right? Through those broken moments. And that type of relationship with God at 16 onwards began to change the trajectory of my life, really. I remember going out to my backyard through that season, crying hard to God. And he was the only one I could really talk to about this stuff. Because of the, of the difficulty and the shame of even the, the, my aunt's situation, right? My uncle was so broken by that and so hurt by that. And our church family was so broken and hurt by that. I didn't feel like I could bring that up to anybody. You know what I mean? I yeah. didn't talk about that much. Yeah. And then my mom, my grandpa's death affected her so much. I didn't feel like I could really talk about that much, right? And so it was through prayer during that season and and lifting all these things up to God where him and I really began to, you know, I like I said, I really began to cling to him as my father, as the as the as the one that my soul was longing for. The only thing I could pinpoint, man, is it was utter desperation and brokenness where he was my only, he was my only hope, man. As Josh began to fully submit his life to Christ and turn to him as his only source of hope, the chains of sexual addiction began to loosen. His desires didn't vanish overnight, but gradually the seasons of victory lengthened. And as Josh experienced more freedom, he began to hear the calling of God on his life more clearly. More on that after the break. 
This episode is brought to you in part by He Gets Us, a national campaign bringing the story of Jesus to every zip code. Reaching over 1 million people daily with more than 275 million views on YouTube, this is the largest campaign ever to open hearts and minds for Jesus. Now, He Gets Us is giving churches free ways to connect to the campaign so they can leverage the moment and movement for their ministries. When you connect, you'll get resources designed to give your people new ways to have conversations about Jesus and understand the culture they encounter every day. Things like discussion guides, reading plans, sermons, and more. It's easy. Just go to hegetsuspartners.com to learn more. Then you're ready to click those buttons that say, Get Free Tools. He Gets Us is helping people discover, rediscover, and talk about Jesus. And you can too. Just visit hegetsuspartners.com to learn more and join the movement. This episode is brought to you in part by Seattle's Union Gospel Mission. Over 13,000 people in the Seattle area are homeless. Crystal is helping to make a difference through Seattle's Union Gospel Mission. I was homeless on and off for 20 years. It was a nightmare the whole time. I was addicted to meth. I knew I wanted a different life, but I didn't know how to obtain it. One night, the mission search and rescue team reached out to me, but I wasn't ready. They kept checking on me for two more years. They really cared about me as a person. When I got clean, I knew I never wanted to go back. Now, I'm working as an outreach specialist for the mission. I am just so blessed to have this opportunity to help people out on the streets in the same position that I was. With God's love, anything is possible. To hear more, volunteer, or donate, visit UGM.org. Welcome back to Compelled. We've been listening to Josh Howard share how he grew up in a Christian family, but then rapidly his family fell apart. His grandfather died, his mother became an alcoholic, his aunt was sent to prison, and his uncle couldn't handle the emotional grief. Josh realized that the only source of stability in his life was Christ, the solid rock. And with that realization came a renewed interest in serving him. The the next summer, um, I went to a church camp that I would go to every single year. There, I met a guy that was, uh, he was only, I don't know, five, maybe five years older than me uh, in his early 20s, was leading a church in a, a city about an hour away from where I lived. We began to talk, and he said, Josh, would you consider coming and doing an internship with me? And I said, well, what's that entail? He said, well, we're starting this new like youth college age type service on a Sunday night. I'd want you to come help me start it and lead it, and you can preach every other week at that service. You mean I'll like move my senior year of high school away from, you know, who I've been going to school with, you know, for a long time? And he's like, yeah. And so, man, I began to pray through that. And I knew that I wanted to give everything I had to Jesus. I knew that I wanted to be a pastor and a preacher. And this was a massive opportunity, right? The the pastor I grew up with, uh, the pastor of my church growing up, um, he was such an amazing supportive pastor. Like uh, two or three times a year, all throughout junior high and high school, he let me preach at the church on Sunday morning two or three times a year. So he was helping, you know, kind of give me a stage and give me opportunity. And then I've got this guy in my life that I met who's just five or six years older than me who's saying, hey, why don't you come? And so I pray through it, pack up. It was a couple months into my senior year of high school and moved away from <laughs> the town that I lived in. I had this little apartment on Main Street in St. Elmo above some little shop. I was I had one of those like, you know, uh, second story apartments that was above a store, you know, one of those. And I'm 17, 18 years old now, living alone and serving in this town. Yeah. Now, at that point, I would have never told you, you know, I'm feeling called overseas. I, I thought I would travel and preach and always come back to America. So in my in my head, 
I'm Billy Graham. Okay. Like, yeah, not, not really Billy Graham, but that's yeah. like the life I was dreaming of, man. Like I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to preach. I'm going to lead lots of people to Jesus. You know that in at 18, right? The, the arrogant, prideful 18 year old only child, right? He's like, I'm taking the world for Jesus all by myself. You know, Josh was still young and he still needed to do a lot of maturing, especially in the area of humility, which would be a process. But after a second internship, Josh was certain he wanted to enter the ministry full-time. So he enrolled in Bible college, which is where God placed a new burden on his heart. And it was while I was in college, man, that God really began to grip my heart for the nations. He began to lift my eyes off of a, a, a Western context and onto the, the most difficult, darkest places of the world. I was at a, a, a conference on missions. It was my, I think, sophomore year of college, I believe. I'm at this conference. I'm sitting there. I don't remember the pastor's name, what he preached. I mean, it's, there's like 5,000 people there. It's, it's a massive crowd in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm sitting there. I don't remember what he preached. Don't remember a sermon. All I remember is that he quoted some other guy. Okay, Isn't that how the Holy Spirit works? And his quote, which was a famous quote, I just had never heard it before, okay? And this is what he said. If you have but one light to burn, would you rather burn it in a land filled with darkness or one glowing with light? And he gave an invitation that night to come up and give your life to the darkest places in the earth. And man, I practically ran forward that night and gave my life to missions and nothing magical happened. I was expecting kind of like that the the time I got baptized or the time I uh, I preached my first sermon. I was expecting this like, I don't know, this explosion of emotion and all this stuff. And what ended up happening was there was like a 19 year old college kid that was up there helping volunteer as a part of the as a part of the invitation time, and he did like a 10 second prayer with me, and that was it. And I'm like, well, what what's next? You yeah. know, whatever. And so that night, I go back to my hotel room. I'll stand at a courtyard Marriott, and so I go out into the courtyard in the middle of the hotel. And nobody's out there. I get on my knees, man, and I'm crying out to God. And this is what I heard God say to me that night. Okay. I, I, it wasn't audible, but I'm giving everything over. I mean, I'm laying it all down. I'm saying I'm ready. God, I don't care if I'm in quick trip for five minutes, a gas station for five minutes, or if I'm, you know, in Haiti for 50 years. I just want to do what you've called me to do. Yeah. I'm laying it all out there. And what I hear him say to me, honestly, it broke my heart at the beginning. He said, Josh, I don't need you. It's like, what do you mean you don't need me? Like, you're calling me to missions. I don't need you. And he's like, I don't, I, I don't need you. I'm God. I can do whatever I want. I can call thousands more that are like you. But then he followed it up with this man, and this phrase changed my life, and it set me on a trajectory forward. He said, Josh, I don't need you, but I need you to know that I want you. And being wanted by God is so much greater than being needed by God. He wants us. He wants to use us. He wants us to be in a relationship with him. He doesn't need us. God can snap his fingers and do whatever he wants. He wants us, and he wants to use us in his mission to accomplish his mission on the earth. And at that point, man, I laid it all down. I said, okay, God, if you want me, I'm yours, and I want to do anything it takes, whatever it takes, to see your mission accomplished in the world. The very next morning, man, I went to a breakout session at this missions conference and met a guy who was offering an internship to go overseas the next morning. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. God's like, all right, if you say yes, I'm, I'm yours. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I've, I've got you. You yeah. know what I mean? I apply for the job. It's a photojournalism opportunity. And I was, I was a photographer as a hobby, never as a job, but I love to do it. And they wanted to send somebody to eight different countries to take photos for them for three months. And I'm like, man, this is a dream internship for a college guy, right? Yeah. And so I apply. A few months later, I drive down to their headquarters, do an interview. They leave the room. They come back in and they're like, hey, you got the job. And some of that old pride began to creep up in my heart, right? So I ask them, I'm like, well, how many other people applied? Like, I wanted to know how many people I beat out of this yeah. job, okay? They looked at me and said, 
you were the only one. (laughs) 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 And so the pride went away and I'm like, all right, so if you want this job done, I'm your only shot at getting it done. Is that what you're saying? Um, And so they sent me overseas, man. And the whole reason I took the trip was to pray and ask God, God, is it one of these places you want me to be? And so I went to the Philippines, I went to Kenya, I went to Thailand and Myanmar, Mexico, Ukraine, stopped in Qatar, and and India was one of the places that I went to. And when I stepped off the plane in India, there was that old familiar voice again that I began to feel a burden on my heart for that country unlike any other place I'd been. I even called my mom that night and I said, mom, I think this might be the place. I, I traveled around India. I was walked into a little church in Damo, India in Madhya Pradesh. I sat down next to the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in my life. She was going to help translate what was going on in the service. And I didn't know it at the time, but that woman is now my wife and she's a beautiful, amazing Indian woman. I married way up, man, way up. And so... We met, man, in August, engaged in December, married in May, and I moved to India full-time a month before our wedding. Right away, Josh got plugged into his father-in-law's church and existing ministry called Central India Christian Mission. Their goal was to share the good news of Jesus with the lost and to train and disciple existing believers. The entire ministry team was run by Indian nationals, and Josh was the only American. And once he was on the ground and ready to start working, Josh realized that he had much to learn from them. So here's a dirty secret of the mission field, okay? The same guy you are when you get on the plane is the same guy you are when you get off the plane. And what that meant for me was when I moved to India, I got off the plane having a lot of previous ministry experience. I had preached a lot of sermons, done a lot of stuff like that, had never really made a disciple in my life. I mean, I had never walked with someone one-on-one or in a small group setting to help them become all that Jesus had called them to be and to be a disciple who also can go make more disciples. I had never done that in my life, okay? And so here I am in India thinking I'm going to be the big bad missionary that comes and saves everybody. And really what happened, man, is that the Indian believers taught me how to follow Jesus. That's what really happened. I met men and women that were willing to risk everything for the sake of the gospel. I met young 17, 18 year old kids who knew that if they said yes to Jesus, they were going to be kicked out of their families and their parents would disown them and never let them come back to their village. And they said yes anyway. I met pastors who were beaten for their faith and were preaching the next week. Women who were raped for their faith and still continue to proclaim the gospel. I mean, we're talking about people that were in horrendous situations and stayed faithful to Jesus anyway, okay? And so when I said that I loved Jesus, that didn't seem to be the equivalent of what it meant for them to say they loved Jesus. Yeah, yeah. When I compared my love for Jesus to their love to Jesus— my love started to look a little bit more like liking Jesus. Like I say, I love a lot of things. Like I love Jesus. I also love Taco Bell. I also love pizza. I love Olive Garden. Okay. And I love my wife and my kids. And I use the same word for all of those things. And there are different levels of commitment (laughs) that I have to those things, but I use the same word. And when they say they love Jesus, There was a major difference in commitment level to what I had in my heart when I said I love Jesus. The consecration to him, the surrender they had, the dedication, the courage, the boldness, the faithfulness, all that was at a whole different level. I mean, I'm peewee baseball playing in the major leagues. You know what I mean? Like it's it was a whole different ballgame. And so I meet these Indian believers who are head over heels in love with Jesus, willing to risk everything for the sake of his name, willing to go through persecution in order to proclaim the gospel. And that's what I mean when I said, when I moved to India, rather than being the one that came and changed things, I was the one that was changed. They taught me how to love and follow Jesus. That's what really happened. Five years passed, and by 2013, Josh and his fellow teammates were brainstorming How could they bring the gospel to even more of India faster? 
We've got 1.3 billion people. There's more unreached people groups in India than any other nation in the world. And so we're sitting and dreaming and praying about, okay, God, what, it, what would it look like to bring your love all over this nation? How could we take your name and fame everywhere that we go, right? What does that look like? And I remember, you know, even I'm kind of a dreamer, a visionary, right? Like the Indian believers, they'll pray first. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about vision first. You know what I mean? Like, that's just the kind of person I am. And so I remember thinking like, what could be a massive goal that we could reach? And I'm thinking proclamation. I'm thinking, how can we reach as many people as possible with the gospel at one go? When I say proclamation, that could be radio, TV, it could be even adding people to the church or whatever to listen, right? Like I'm, and so I'm thinking anything we can, bro. I'm like, what if we could bring a hundred thousand people a year to Jesus? Okay. Through preaching the gospel broadly and widely. And everybody's like, yeah, that would be amazing. They'd write books about us. Yeah. They'd write books about us, you know, whatever. And then I remember pulling out my calculator and putting a hundred thousand into 1.3 billion and realizing at that rate, it would take us 13,000 years to reach India. And I'm like, even if we add a zero to that, if it's a million people a year, it's still 1,300 years to reach India. And it's like, this isn't going to work. A traditional method of just adding churches and adding people and trying to broadly uh, proclaim the gospel without truly making disciples who multiply, okay? See, multiplication is completely different than addition. Here's the cool thing, okay? If you do 10 plus 10, okay? I know on a podcast, it's hard to picture this in your head. You do 10 plus 10, it's 20. You do 10 times 10 with an X sign, it's 100, okay? You go from 20 to 100 just by changing an addition sign to a multiplication sign. Here's the cool thing. Those two symbols are identical, but one of them is flipped 45 degrees. It's a slight shift 45 degrees, and it multiplies the impact that you have, okay? And so what we began to dream about, I never heard of church, you know, multiplication movements or church planting movements or disciple making movements. I never heard those words, but whenever we put it in our calculator that, man, using traditional ministry practices of adding people and adding churches and proclaiming broadly, it was never going to complete the task. We knew that something had to change. We knew that something had to be different. So we began to pray. We began to ask God, what can we do to actually impact this nation with the gospel? And that's when I stumbled across this book by a guy named Ying Kai in China. The book was called T4T, uh, the letter T, the number four, the letter T. It stood for Training for Trainers. And I read in this book in China, long story short, Ying and his wife Grace moved to South China with a vision to reach the whole region with the gospel. Instead of doing traditional addition methods, they said, no, we're going to disciple somebody, train them and equip them so that they can go reach more people, so that they can go reach more people. They were thinking multiplication, exponential growth, think compound interest. That's what they were thinking in the kingdom. In 10 years, by using that type of thinking, they saw over 200,000 churches started and over a million people baptized. And I remember reading that book, man, I began to cry and I muttered out this prayer to Jesus. Jesus, if you can do it there, I know you can do it here. If you can move there, I know you can move like that here. And so the thing that Jesus really spoke to me about during that season of my life is this. He said, basically in my heart, Josh, every generation is a new great commission. Let that sink in. Every generation is a new great commission. And what that means is the 7 billion or so people on the planet right now, none of them were here 150 years ago. None of them. So if we're going to see the Great Commission completed, it can't be a 13,000-year task. <laughs> it's got to be done in our lifetime, in this generation, or else in another 150 years, there's going to be another 9 billion people or whatever that many of them have still not heard the gospel. Yeah. And yeah. so every generation, man, it's time for us to get the job done in our lifetime, in our generation.
when a destination is that big and that far, the vehicle we choose to get there has to be able to get us to that destination. And so for us in India, that vehicle became multiplying house churches, multiplying disciples, because it's grassroots, it multiplies quickly, it doesn't cost much money, and those types of vehicles is what is go it's going to take in order to see the Great Commission completed in a generation. A key premise of this discipleship-making concept is self-replication. You share the gospel with the lost, and some of them are saved. Instead of moving on and never seeing them again, you stay close to them and disciple them in how to follow Jesus, all the while training them how to share their own faith the same way that you shared yours with them, so that they too may go and make disciples of Jesus. And frankly, this entire idea is rooted in the book of Acts. The early Christian church grew so rapidly, not because of a handful of influential individuals like Peter and Paul, although apostles like them certainly played a vital role, but because regular people were becoming followers of Jesus and then turning right around and sharing the good news with their friends, family, and neighbors, who in turn did the same. God will use anyone, and the Great Commission applies to everyone. Disciples who make disciples who make disciples, and so on. Josh and his team were excited about this idea but could it actually work practically today in India? More on that after the break. Worldview is everything because it tells us what's important, what's not, and how to respond to tough life situations. And one of the most critical times to establish a biblical worldview is during childhood and adolescence. That's why BJU Press places the highest priority on equipping students with a biblical worldview from day one. And actually, I've seen it at work in my own family. You see, 14 years ago, my cousin was a high school junior and did not know the Lord. In fact, he frequently got in trouble at school and could sometimes even be violent. The situation became serious enough that my aunt and uncle sent him to a military boarding school, but that only made matters worse. Finally, in desperation, they sent him to the school that helped create BJU Press, where he was exposed to a comprehensive worldview shaped by the Bible. Every subject from literature to math to science to history was discussed through the lens of God's Word. And that's where my cousin gave his life to Christ 14 years ago and was totally transformed. Today, BJU Press produces world-class curriculum with academic rigor and uncompromising Christian faith, and they would love to help equip you and your student with that same outlook. Because as my cousin would say, worldview is everything. Learn more at BJUPressHomeschool.com. Again, that's BJUPressHomeschool.com. What if I told you there was an app to help you focus on the Lord during your daily devotions, has a customizable prayer reminder schedule, and can even help you sleep at night? Well, that app exists. It's called Abide, and it's used by millions of people around the world, including me. There are several handy features built into it, including customizable background music, a journal, devotionals, and narrated stories. And of course, there's a sleep timer. And one of our former compelled guests, John Fornoff, is actually the creator behind several of the stories in the app. As you'll recall from episode 15, John has had a long career in audio drama, including writing and directing for Adventures in Odyssey. And now he's created a new series that's available exclusively on Abide called Skyship Dreamer. If you have kids, they'll love his new series, or if you're still a kid at heart like me, you'll love it too. Abide is free to use and download, but they've also agreed to give Compelled listeners an exclusive 25% off your first year when you redeem a premium subscription. But only if you text the promo code COMPELLED to 22433. Again, you could get 25% off your premium Abide subscription when you text promo code COMPELLED to 22433. That's 22433. Welcome back to Compelled. Josh was very excited about this concept of self-replicating discipleship, but could it work in real life? There was only one way to find out. When we launched this initiative, we launched it at our local church. It's a church that's literally was planted 150 years ago by missionaries, okay, in our town. It was my turn to preach. And I'm launching this vision for multiplication to the church because I wanted to start in our local church, right? 
So man, I prepare, I plan. I've even got slides with a calculator showing how long it'll take us to reach India. And with multiplication, it actually, when you're multiplying disciples, the way that Jesus has called us to, it could literally take 15 or 20 years to reach India rather than 13,000 because it's just the exponential growth curve of multiplication. You know what I mean? When you're doubling, you go from one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16. The first few years, that's really low. But once you get up into the thousands, I mean, you're going 4,000 to 8,000, 8 to 16,000. And when you get in the millions, man, you go from 50 million to 100 million when you're doubling. Do you you understand what I'm saying? So like I've got these slides up there showing how fast we can reach India. I'm telling Ying Kai's story, right? And man, I'm expecting Pentecost Sunday, okay? Like I'm ready for 3,000 people to come forward. There were only 1,200 people there that day, but I was ready for 3,000. I thought little Indian women off the street were gonna come, you know? That day when I was preaching, I felt like it was the best sermon I'd ever given in my life. You know, it was one of those feelings like, man, this is awesome. They're all gonna come. And so I gave an invitation to start being a disciple who goes and makes disciples, a multiplying disciple, a reproducing disciple. And it wasn't even a high bar challenge. It wasn't like I said, you've got to deny yourself, pick up your cross, man, die to everything, and then come make disciples, right? Get your life in order first and then come do this. It wasn't one of those talks. My talk was kind of more like this. If you kind of want to maybe make disciples, come up and we'll help you. Okay, that's that's kind of what it was, all right? And man, I was I gave the invitation. I was expecting the floodgates to open. And out of 1,200 people, 12 people came forward. And I was upset, man. I mean, I was looking out in the crowd like, do you not even love Jesus? Like, what's the problem here? You know what I mean? Like, what's what's the issue? I remember watching one guy come up and I'm like, really, this guy? Like, I don't want this guy. Like, that's, that's how I was feeling, you know? He was this uneducated village guy, couldn't even hardly read or write. And I'm like, what are we gonna do with him? And, and I'm looking out there in the crowd, looking at people that I would have picked. And I'm almost doing this baseball draft in my head. Like, I'll give you three of them for one of them, you know, or something like, like, I'm just like, it's, it's like, what is going to happen? And so I'm upset. I'm frustrated. Had a guy sitting next to me and he said, Josh, I know another guy who started with 12 people and they did okay. Yeah. I still don't know who he was talking about. Right. Uh, (laughs) And so we started training these 12. I had 11 people that didn't do anything. I mean, they came every week. They were getting trained on how to go do this, but would go and do nothing, okay? Nothing. But there was that one guy who was the uneducated village guy who couldn't even hardly read or write. And after we trained him in the first two weeks, man, he started eight house churches and surrounding villages, reached eight villages with the gospel. This one guy in two weeks. And he's what did it for me, man. I I had to go repent after that, no joke. I had to go get alone and say, Jesus, I'm sorry I underestimated what you can do through ordinary people. I'm sorry that I did not um, give this guy credit for putting his yes on the table (laughs) and saying, God, use me. I'm so sorry that I did not see you in him enough to know that you can use anybody to perform your work. And he's what did it for me, man. I'm so thankful for him because if it weren't for him, man, I probably would have quit and done something else. You know what I mean? If I went 0 for 12 (laughs) on the disciples I was making, it would have been bad. I'm like, Jesus had 11 out of 12 at least, you know? And so this guy sold it, man. And so for us at that point, when we saw what God can do through one person that just laid it all out there, I mean, for me, he was he was the gathering demoniac for me. He was the Samaritan woman for me, you know, the Samaritan woman who went and reached her whole village after Jesus told her everything she had ever done, or the demoniac that went and preached to 10 cities, the Decapolis, after Jesus healed him. I mean, that's who this guy was for me, a guy that nobody expected that would do anything. But after getting gripped with Jesus, just goes and reaches these eight villages. And so after that, man, we started traveling and training as many people as we could. And we're training on how to be a disciple who makes disciples. How do you share your faith? How do you make disciples? How do you engage lost people with the gospel? How do you pray for people? Like, what does this look like, right? How do you start house churches that will multiply? What All this, right? Because the whole time we're thinking about the destination. How do we get this job done? What's it going to take to fulfill God's vision? Long story short, man, in the last eight years, 
We've seen now over 10,000 churches that have been started that are still meeting right now today. And here's the crazy part of exponential growth. 5,000 of those churches were started last year in 2021. 5,118 churches were started last year. And so over 50% of the churches that have been started were last year because of exponential growth and multiplication. And so we are seeing God do miraculous, amazing things. And now we're at a point, man, where it's like, man, how do we stay out of God's way and just let him keep moving? And so how do we just continue to run with him towards the destination that he has and follow his lead, right? And so it's been a miraculous, amazing journey towards that. It's been almost 10 years since Josh and his team launched their self-replicating discipleship initiative, and they've seen a lot of fruit, including new churches that they've helped plant in Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh, and they have no plans to stop now. But one last story Josh shared with me about discipleship making really stood out. It happened just four years ago in 2018 in the island nation of Sri Lanka, just off the southern tip of India. So we're in Sri Lanka at a public proclamation event. We had already done a lot of movement training. We were wanting to train local leaders on how to make disciples who multiply, but also proclaim the gospel broadly to this city. So we're on this large open field in Sri Lanka. Depending on the night, we'll have between five and 10,000 people on this field to hear the gospel, okay? It's crazy. We're preaching, we're talking about Jesus, okay? The second night, okay? The second night, um, there were probably, I don't know, 8,000 people there were preaching. Tons of people come to faith. It was unbelievable, an incredible night. They're getting followed up with and being discipled by local people. It, it was an incredible thing. We're stacking up chairs at the end of the night because we're renting these chairs. We got to put them in a truck and then set them up the next night, okay? Our team is setting it, like stacking up chairs. I was praying with the last family. No one else was on the ground. And all of a sudden, off the street, this, this guy stumbles off the street coming towards us. And so I kind of caught him out of the corner of my eye. He was walking towards us, was stumbling around, seemed kind of drunk. And so I'm like, what is going on, you know? And so I finished praying for the family and the guy saw me and he dropped to his knees, like super weird on the ground. I'm like, what is going on, right? And when I start walking towards him, he stands up and walks away from me, okay? So I yelled out at him. I said, hey, hey man. The guy turns around, anger in his eyes, and starts screaming at me in English. This guy didn't know English, okay? And he's screaming at me in English. Weird point number one, okay? Yeah. He's beating his chest. This is my boy. You can't have my boy. This is my boy. And he's pointing to himself. This is my boy. You can't have my boy. We're thinking, what is going on, right? And so our team goes over and starts praying for him. Now this man was, he had a, an evil spirit inside of him is what happened. Our team prays, um, the evil spirit leaves, and this guy comes to him, okay? Like back to his full senses. Now he's talking in uh, Tamil, because he was a Tamil speaker. He didn't speak English, okay? So now he's speaking back in Tamil again. And we ask him what's going on. I have a translator with me. And we said, hey man, what, what happened? What's going on? So here's his story. He had grown up as a pastor's son grew up in church. His mom got cancer and he knew that Jesus was going to heal his mom. He prayed and prayed and prayed, believed, 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 and his mom died of cancer. And like the stories we were talking about earlier, there was a choice to make. Yeah. He could cling to the father or get so angry at the father that he would run away. And that's what he did. He rejected Jesus said, if you can't heal my mom, I don't want anything to do with you. He tattooed on his arm, my mother is my God, and began to pray to his mom, okay? He started visiting these people that they call them like black magicians in Sri Lanka, but it's kind of dark art stuff, black magic kind of stuff, in order to try to speak to the spirits because he wanted to talk to his mom again. And that opened his life up to all this spiritual junk. Pretty soon, as he was praying to his mom, going to these spiritists and stuff, he started to hear a voice in his head, a female voice. He thought it was his mom. And at first it was very loving. And that voice became more and more judgmental, angry, and he couldn't get it to stop. 
And the voice kept going and going and would tell him to do things that no mother would ever tell her son to do. He realized it wasn't his mom, but he couldn't get it to stop. So he started drinking, lost his job, lost his family, had run away from home anyway, everything was broken. And that night, he was passed out drunk at his house that was a mile away from the ground that we were preaching on. And he said a voice woke him up and it was the first male voice he'd ever heard in his head. The female voice was the one always there. It was the first male voice and it said, son, get up and leave. It woke him up out of his drunken stupor. He got up, put a shirt on and stumbled outside, had no idea where he was going. Walked down the street a mile, stumbled across on the ground that we were on and that's where he met us. What that did to my heart that night, man, and the story's not done yet. What that did to my heart that night, I was preaching that night on a ground to 8,000 people. But do you know where God's attention also was that night? It wasn't just on the 8,000. We still serve a God that's leaving the 99 to go after the one. His attention was also on a lost son, passed out drunk a mile away, and with an audible voice waking him up out of his drunken stupor to come to encounter him again. That's the God we serve, man. It's beautiful. So that night, the demon's gone. He tells us a story, gives his life to Jesus because the voice is gone for the first time in like three years, gives his life to Jesus. He called his dad, his pastor. His dad was a pastor. He had run away from home like five years prior. His dad hadn't talked to him in three years. Gets on the phone. I'm able to tell his dad, his dad spoke a little bit of English. I was able to tell his dad that his son had given his life to Jesus, knelt down on the ground that night and gave his life to Jesus. His dad starts weeping on the phone. I've been praying for this every day for three years. Thank you so much. And I had to tell him, we didn't do anything. The God you've been praying to woke your son up and brought him here to encounter himself. Yeah. Okay. The next night, there's 10,000 people on the ground. This guy comes clean shaven, looks like a completely different guy in a dress shirt, dress pants, comes and volunteers to be on our prayer team, is praying for people afterwards. We bring him up on the stage and he's able to share his testimony in front of 10,000 people the next night, okay? Planted a church, led 70 people to Christ within the next year. Wow. And is now leading that church. And his dad moved to help him lead that church. Wow. So now the father and son are reunited, leading a church together. A church that his son planted after being demon possessed, drunk, rejected God after his mom passed away, and then restored, healed, redeemed again. That's an amazing, I mean, that, that shows how amazing our God really is. Wow. It has been a pleasure sitting down and chatting with you, man. I really appreciate it. It it was an honor. Thank you so much for having me and uh, really, really appreciate you too, Paul. I'm certain that when Josh was just a teenager in St. Louis, reeling from his family's difficulties, he had no clue that one day he would be living on the opposite side of the world, watching the gospel spread like a wildfire. Josh first felt the calling to go overseas when he was at the missions conference during Bible college. And the quote that made such an impact on him was from the Scottish missionary, Ian Keith Falconer, which says, I have but one candle of life to burn, and I would rather burn it out in a land filled with darkness than in a land flooded with light. My encouragement to all of you listening this week is how can we shine our lights in a way to reach the dark? We may not be called to go into full-time missions, but God is calling us, no matter where we are, to be a light for Him. Today, Josh and his wife, Lashi, have been married for 14 years and have three kids. Josh still works full-time with Central India Christian Mission, which participates in a whole host of kingdom work, including church planting, a Bible college, crisis relief, medical missions, children's homes, and more. Seriously, they do a lot. To learn more about them, visit their website at indiamission.org. Again, their website is indiamission.org. Also, Josh co-wrote a book with his father-in-law called Christian Extremism, A Life Worth Dying For. If you'd like to win an autographed copy, head over to our website, compiledpodcast.com, pull up the show notes for this episode, and enter the drawing for this week. 
And of course, we'll include a link to where you can purchase a copy of the book for yourself and more information about Central India Christian Mission and self-replicating discipleship movements. If you've enjoyed listening to Compelled, then please take a minute and share it with a friend. One of the biggest reasons someone decides to listen to a new podcast is if they've received a personal recommendation from a friend. And we would love for as many people as possible to be encouraged by these stories of what God is doing. And if you'd like to help us create more stories just like this one, then join Compelled as a monthly Patreon supporter and get early access to next week's episode. Get started at compelledpodcast.com and click donate. Finally, if you're looking for a podcast app on your cell phone, then we recommend our sponsor, CastBox. Their app is easy to use and lets you download episodes ahead of time to listen to when you're offline. And it's free. Learn more at castbox.fm. This episode was edited by Will Jackson. Our sound engineer is Zach Fowler and our associate producer is Sarah Hastings. Stay tuned for a sneak peek from next week's story with Ramona Cherko. For years, Ramona and her husband served in churches together. On the outside, it looked like they had a picture-perfect marriage, but in reality, Ramona was carrying a dark secret. Her husband was emotionally and physically abusive, and Ramona had lost all hope until she realized that the source of true hope had never left. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and you've been listening to Compelled. We'll be back with another compelling story next Tuesday. It was on the flights to and from Canada that I very first started thinking about leaving him. I couldn't tell him. I mean, he, he would definitely physically prevent me from leaving. God had kept me safe through these things, but I knew if I told him that I was thinking of leaving, um, I could see him getting so mad that he accidentally really hurt me.